We want to consider the topic, Words of Light from a Dungeon of Darkness. I want to read a couple of verses in Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 14. And here the Apostle Paul is writing to the saints in Philippi. And he says, But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. Now, Paul is in prison. It's a very unfortunate circumstance that he is facing. He's in jail. He's confined. And then he goes on and he says, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The topic, words of light from a dungeon of darkness, I think is a very important topic because we see a lot of darkness today. The darkness is uh, everywhere. But there's a point that we need to remember, and that point is that the gospel will shine no matter what happens in every circumstance, even in negative circumstances, in circumstances that you and I might think would be very prohibitive to the preaching of the gospel, the gospel will shine. I want to tell a little story that I think maybe illustrates uh, that point uh, and a story that illustrates why we need to, to remember that point. One day, a man went to see his doctor and he said, Doc, I heard all over from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And uh, the doctor said, really? Uh, from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet? And he, the doctor said to the man, he said, well, well, touch your head, show me where it hurts. And so the man touched his head and said, oh, oh that's so painful. And the doctor said, wow. He said, uh, how about your elbow? So the man got his finger and touched his elbow, and then he grimaced in pain. He just, oh, it's so agonizing to me. There's so much pain. And the doctor said to him, uh, what about your knee? So the man reached down and touched his knee and then he just let out a, a deep groan. He just moaned deep within himself. And the doctor said, well, you, didn't you say that uh, you hurt at the bottom of your feet? He said, well, touch the bottom of your foot. So the man reached down and pressed on the bottom of his foot and, and he let out another moan and another groan. And the doctor looked at him and said, well, sir, you've got a dislocated finger. You see, are we missing the really important thing, that one really important thing uh, that's affecting our whole attitude? Uh, are we like missing the problem? What is the problem? I think the problem is forgetfulness. We are forgetting a very, very important principle. And that principle is that the gospel will prevail despite the darkness. It will prevail even in the most distressing of circumstances. So number one, I want to point out that the light shines in the darkness. We just read from Philippians 1, 12 through 14, and I did point out that Paul was in prison. Uh, Philippians is one of the prison epistles. He was incarcerated, and I think incarceration must have been very, very hard on the Apostle Paul. Paul loved to travel, not just for the sake of traveling and going around and seeing the countryside, but he loved to travel so that he could go to places where the gospel had never been proclaimed before. But now suddenly, the Apostle Paul finds himself in prison. He is in a dungeon. It must have been a very, very difficult situation for the Apostle Paul. Uh, he could not travel. He could not go to other parts of the ancient world to tell people about Jesus Christ. In fact, most likely he was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. And the Mamertine prison is still there today, and there's a dungeon in the Mamertine prison, um, which is at the bottom of the prison. Uh, it's, it's underground. There is a stream that goes through the dungeon, and you can imagine how clammy how cold, how damp it was in that dungeon. And yet, the Apostle Paul says, hey, I want you to know that what's happened to me, these most distressing circumstances, they've turned out actually for the furtherance of the gospel, not for the restriction of the Word of God, not for the snuffing out of the Word of God, 
God has me here because he's got a purpose. He wants me to preach the gospel to these folks in this dungeon. So I think it's very important to remember that the light of the gospel will shine no matter what the circumstances are. God's word, God's good news, and the gospel is good news, it will get out no matter what happens and what the circumstances. One day, uh, and this is a story that Martin Luther used to tell, one day Satan had a planning session with all of his imps and all of his little demons, and he said, guys, he said, we've got to find the most effective weapon to stop the uh, spread of Christianity. And so, of course, Satan doesn't want the good news to spread. He doesn't want it to go out. He doesn't want it to go everywhere. He doesn't want people uh, to be saved. So Satan said, tell me, what, what, what kind of weapons are you coming up with? And so one of the M's said, well, why don't we attack the Bible? Why don't we tell people that the Bible is made up of a lot of fairy tales? It's just a lot of Hebrew myths. It's not true. And, and Satan said, nah, that won't work at all. Uh, people know that the Bible is well-founded, that the Bible is authoritative. They have the witness of the Holy Spirit. That attack on the Bible won't do. And then another imp says, well, I know what we'll do. We'll incite governments to persecute Christians. We'll, we'll make it so, so governments imprison the saints, so that governments uh, execute the saints and take off their heads and punish them and incarcerate them. And the devil thought about that and he said, ah, I said, uh, that weapon won't work either because the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So that was another weapon that Satan rejected. And then one little imp jumped up and he raised his hand. He says, I know what we'll use. I've got the best, the most effective weapon of all. And the devil said, well, my friend, tell me what it is. And that little imp said, it is discouragement. Discouragement will work. If you can get God's people discouraged, then you've slowed down the work of Christ. And so that's why I want to share this message with you. I, be, I believe it's a very important message. It's a message that we all need to be mindful of, that no matter what the circumstances, no matter how dark the prison, how damp the prison, how deep the dungeon, the Word of God, the light of the gospel will go forth. And as Paul said, these very circumstances have rather turned out for the furtherance of uh, Jesus Christ and His blessed Word. And of course, that's one of the things that we believe at Southwest Radio Church. We say it every day. God is still on the throne and prayer changes things. Now, there's a second thing I want to point out, and that is that God guarantees that the light will overcome the darkness. You say, Pastor Larry, how's that possible? How can God guarantee that the light will overcome the darkness? Well, I want to turn with you to uh, Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, we read of the uh, triumphal entry, and I want to read from verses 37 through 40. In Luke 19, verse 37, it says, And when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. So here we see there's a lot of happy people. Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. This is his triumphal entry. Zechariah 9.9 says that this is what the king would do. And all the people who had been oppressed under uh, the Roman occupation, they were so happy. The Bible says they were praising uh, God and they were rejoicing. Rejoicing is an inner attitude. Praise is the outward expression of that attitude. So you can imagine it was a very loud, a very noisy time. People were so happy that their king had come to them. And yet Jesus said, if I tell them to be quiet, if I tell them not to praise the Lord, not to be happy, not to shout, not to sing, not to clap their hands, not to do all of those things, even the stones 
would cry out. And I think that's another illustration, another um, story, another wonderful way of showing that the truth will always come forth. Even the stones would cry out. Just think of stones. They're dead. They're lifeless. They're unresponsive. They're cold. Nobody wants to uh, sleep with a stone. Uh, nobody wants to use a stone as a pillow. They're hard. But here Jesus says, even those things that are inanimate, if, if these people did not give praise, even the stones would cry out. So there is that guarantee that God will speak, that his testimony will go forth no matter what. You remember the story of Balaam uh, and Balaam's donkey. It's in Numbers chapter 22. And we read that the Moabite king Balak uh, hired Balaam to curse the Jews. And of course, that was not a good thing. God did not approve of that. But the Bible tells us in Numbers 22 that Balaam was on his way. And uh, as he was riding his donkey, the donkey stopped because there in the roadway was the angel of the Lord with his sword drawn. So the donkey didn't want to go past that angel. And the donkey, the Bible says, went into the field. And Balaam got all unhappy about that. And he kind of paddled the donkey and, and said, what's wrong with you, you silly brute? And so the, uh, the donkey went a little further. But as he went further, he saw the angel of the Lord with, with his sword drawn. And this time, uh, the donkey crushed uh, Balaam's foot against the wall. It was a stone wall, probably very rough. And Balaam was, was very, very angry. And Balaam began to, to beat the donkey once again. Well, they went a little further. And uh, you see, uh, Balaam didn't know anything about this. He didn't have the sense to realize that he was doing something that was wrong. He was going to curse God's people that was not right. And so they go a little further. And once again, the donkey notices the angel of the Lord with his sword drawn. And the donkey could go to the right. The donkey could go to the left. So what does the donkey do? The donkey collapses. And the donkey says, why are you beating me? I, I'm trying to save your life. I'm trying to rescue you. There's the angel of the Lord here. You're doing something that's wrong, something that's against the word of God. Even a donkey could come forth with the truth of God's word. So God has so many ways of getting his truth out, and he does it in a most marvelous and powerful way. And then there's another account in Matthew chapter 21. If uh, you're able to turn to your Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 21. Uh, this is a passage that shows us of uh, Jesus casting out the money changers. And I want to read in Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 16. It says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer. And in another scripture it says, The house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. So you can imagine the excitement when the people saw that uh, Jesus rebuked the hypocrisy that was being carried out by the religious leaders. Uh, the blind were emboldened. Uh, the lame were emboldened. Uh, they were saying, hey, this guy understands me. He knows my need. I won't be chased out. And so he came to Jesus in the temple. And the Bible says he healed them. And then in verse 15 it says, And when the chief priest and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Hey friends, have you ever noticed when something good is happening? When God's spirit is working, when the Lord is bringing change, there's always someone who gripes. There's always someone who complains. But here we read that the religious leaders were sore displeased. And then in verse 16, we read, And said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying this. He's saying, you know, if, um, if the adults don't speak the truth, even the babies, even the infants will praise the Lord. God has a way of talking through the stones. 
God has a way of talking through a donkey. God has a way of uh, getting his truth even through the mouths of infants and babies. And God's truth cannot be stopped. God's love is an overwhelming power. It's a gentle power. But it's always there for those who turn to it, for those who accept it and who love uh, God and who want to do the truth. God's truth, God's love is an overwhelming power. Here's another example, and it's in Acts uh, chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4, we read of Peter and John preaching the gospel. They're, they're giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the religious leaders say, well, wait a second, you guys are uneducated. You haven't been to yeshiva. Uh, you haven't been to the seminary. You can't preach in this man's name. And then uh, Peter and John say this, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Once again, God's testimony, God's truth will get out. And so I want to ask you, friends, are you praising God? If you've been touched by His grace, if you're His child, if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, if you believe the Word of God, if you read your Word, the Word of God every day, and have blessings from God, praise the Lord. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. God is so wonderful that we need to praise his name. Now there's a third thing. Not only does God guarantee that the light will get through, not only does he guarantee that the light will shine, but there's a third thing, and that is that the light sustains those in the darkness. You know there are a lot of people in the darkness today. They have many needs, emotional needs, physical needs, spiritual needs, but the, the light sustains those in the darkness. It's kind of like a campfire. If you've ever been out in the wilderness and it's dark and it's cold and nightfall is coming and you're out there and in the distance you see a campfire, what do you do? You go to that campfire. I remember many years ago my hiking buddy Garney and I, we were hiking in western Montana uh, in the Bob Marshall Wilderness Area. It's three and a half billion acres of wilderness. There's no motor vehicles, no scooters, no motorcycles. The only way you can get in there is by horseback or on foot or on a mountain bike. And I remember when we had the campfire going, people would come and they would visit us and the light would sustain them and the light would sustain us. That's true. The light will sustain us when we are in the darkness of misunderstanding. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been misunderstood? Well, we Christians have been misunderstood. Jesus was misunderstood. He wanted to do good. He wanted to bring blessings. He wanted to bring love and healing and grace and mercy. But the Lord Jesus Christ was misunderstood. The light will give you love. The light will help you when you're misunderstood, when you feel like you've been slighted, when you feel like you've been abused and not treated and not recognized for what you're really doing. Remember that the light will sustain you. And that's really the meaning of having God's love in your heart. Jesus is the light of the world. And when he's in your heart, you have his love in your heart. Love is spelled L-O-V-E. Uh, let me tell you what L-O-V-E stands for. First of all, L stands for let be. Let be. There are some things that you can't change. Don't push. There are distressing circumstances. Don't push. Just pray that, that God would intervene. I think of uh, those people I know, those parents, for example, who uh, are praying for their lost teenager, uh, boy or girl, daughter or, or son, whoever. They have love for that person, but they realize that, that they're not getting through. Well, well, pray, pull back, don't force yourself. Just L, let be. That's the first uh, letter in love. L, let be. Don't push. Uh, just, just let it be. Pray to the Lord. He's the one who can handle the situation. So that's the L. And then there's the O, and that means overlook. You know, when people are rude, thoughtless, and unkind, and we do find those around us from time to time, we need to overlook that kind of thing. You know, Proverbs 26 and verse 4 says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. If you do, you'll be just like him. So there are times when 
when people are rude and unkind and thoughtless to us, we need to just overlook it. Don't make a federal case of it, just overlook it. So that's L, O, and then V is be vulnerable. Vulnerability is the way of the cross. You know, in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus, out of love, the eternal Son of God, made him vulnerable to the will of wicked sinners and cruel and corrupt individuals. He suffered for you and he suffered for me because of his love for us and he became vulnerable. And then there's the E at the end of L-O-V-E. Remember, let be, overlook, vulnerability. And then the E stands for emancipate or set free. You know, there are situations in personal relationships where the other person is clearly wrong. You and I know that feeling. The other person makes, makes a boo-boo. The other person has just blown it. And the natural thing to do is say, aha, I've got you. Well, I think if we're really going to have the light of life, the light of love, the light of joy, we have to remember that E, emancipate. Don't play gotcha. Let that person be free. Let that person save face. Hey, your job and my job is not to go around and to correct everybody and to pounce on everybody and to show everybody their errors and their mistakes and their boo-boos. That's certainly not what we are to do. Then there's a fourth thing, and that is the light draws those in darkness. The light is so wonderful, it draws those in darkness. The Bible tells us in John chapter 12 that there were some Greeks who came to Philip and they said, we would see Jesus. We want to see Jesus. We, we've heard so much about Jesus. So, so Philip gets them and he goes to Andrew and then they go to Jesus and they have a discussion. And in their discussion, Jesus says something very, very important. He says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. He's referring to the cross. The cross is so wonderful. And there will be people around the world, I don't care what their ethnicity, what their language, what their skin color, they're all people for whom Jesus Christ died. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. The light has a wonderful, wonderful drawing power. Now friends, before I close, there is a responsibility that you and I have in this. If we're going to get the gospel out, even in dark circumstances, uh, we have to do some things ourselves. Let me tell you a little story, and I'll close with this story. Imagine a young man, he gets up early in the morning and uh, takes a shower and he puts on a white undershirt and uh, he gets all cleaned up and after that he goes out and he jogs five or six miles. Does a great, great run and he gets kind of uh, hot and kind of steamy. Then he goes back home and he has some breakfast and then after breakfast uh, maybe he goes out and mows the lawn and he weed eats and then maybe he goes to a jumba class and does some workout with, with music, you know, the way young people do that. Well, by now it's late in the afternoon and just imagine what that uh, white sweatshirt is all like. It's wet and it's smelly. It's really bad. Supposing he has a date that night, what is he going to do? He's going to take a shower. He's going to get rid of that white, uh, sweat-stained, smelly sweatshirt and put on his best clothing. He wants to, he wants to be clean because he's, he's going out with a young lady and he really wants to impress her. Well, you know, friends, when we go out and share the gospel of Jesus Christ, we too have to be clean. We have to remove all of those things that would, uh, would make us to be a hindrance. Now, there are things perhaps in our lives that do not really reflect the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, what about our language? Is our language clean? Are we saying things that are edifying or are we cutting people down? Are we condemning people? Because people are listening. If we're going to witness to other people, we have to let the light of Jesus Christ shine through us. If, if we're going to have the privilege of being used by the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to take off that old swelly, uh, smelly sweatshirt, throw it away and clean up our act. The light draws those in darkness and Jesus can shine through us, but are we prepared? Are we good witnesses? Are we presenting Jesus Christ in all of his glory 
Are we presenting him in love? We're, we're to speak the truth in love, as Ephesians 4 tells us. And so many times the brethren, they get so, um, well, shall I say it, self-righteous. Some of the brethren think they're better than any, everybody else, and they kind of go out with a bony finger and say, you know, you're, you're living in sin, you're going to hell. Uh, or do we come and present the love of Jesus Christ? I pray that we will allow the light to shine through us. I'll tell you something, if the light doesn't shine through us, the light is going to shine. Somehow, the word is going to get out somehow. But guess what? You and I will miss the wonderful and blessed privilege of being used by the Lord Jesus Christ.